The global shortage of computer chips is affecting many automakers. Businesses and consumers across the globe experiencing a computer chip shortage. Worldwide chip shortage. Earnings being cut by up to $2 billion. We don't have these chips. We're in trouble. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. It's probably not something you think about much, but computer chips are in pretty much everything these days. Which is why when earlier this year there was this semiconductor shortage, we saw delays in products of all kinds from all around the world. Now you would think that given the importance of computer chips in this day and age, there would be companies all over the world making semiconductors. Uh, and you'd be right. But the machines they use to make these chips all come from one single company. It's a company called ASML. And you may have never heard of this company, but they're extremely important because not only are they pushing the boundaries of chip technology, they're becoming a major player in geopolitics at this point. The one company that makes the machines that makes modern life possible. Let's talk about it. We are officially in the age of the Internet of Things. Everything is connected, which means pretty much everything that you can think of has a computer chip in it. From your electric toothbrush, tractors, washing machines, your car, cell phone, obviously, watch, even some shoes. Oh, and Furbies, which are apparently still a thing. It's to the point that e-waste has become a problem, which is something I covered in a previous video. So no, it's not just computers. These things are everywhere, which is why it was such a big deal when the pandemic created this semiconductor shortage. This prompted both the EU and the United States to shore up their semiconductor manufacturing so they don't have to rely on foreign powers. Of course, it wasn't enough to just produce more chips. We also had to prevent our adversaries from doing the same. This is where the geopolitics kick in. Because in a move that didn't make a whole lot of headlines, Biden banned a company from selling chip machines to China. That company was ASML. Okay, so before we get into the nanometer lasers, Faraday cups, the generated plasma from tin, which all, yes, sounds like techno babble from Star Trek episode, let's step back for a second and let's talk about the fundamentals. Yes, it's time to have the talk on where baby semiconductors come from. And if you want to start at the very beginning, it's sand. I don't like sand. Yeah, I know, it gets everywhere, but you know what gets in the sand? Silicon. Before we get anything that remotely looks like a microchip, it all starts at locating and refining sand abundant with silicon. And if you've always wondered why we use silicon for these things, it's because it's both an insulator and a conductor with almost a 50-50 distribution. And it's also easily doped with other elements like boron and phosphorus, which allows for controlling of electrical signals. This lets you create positive and negative states, which translates to ones and zeros. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so you take this silicon-rich sand, you subject it to extreme temperatures, and you throw a little carbon in there. That carbon bonds with oxygen to create carbon monoxide, which isn't great, but with it comes 99% pure silicon, which is awesome. By the way, we're kind of lucky because silicon is the second most abundant element in Earth's crust, making up 28.2%. So that's a thing you know now. I'm probably overthinking this, but I, I do think it's kind of interesting that, you know, in, in, in the Bible they say that God created man from, like, the dirt and sand and stuff, and now we're taking sand and giving it the ability to think, sort of. But the real trick is to get this molten silicon into crystalline form, and to do that, they add a little crystal to the molten silicon. This kind of serves as a nucleation point. Once it cools and crystallizes, you get what they call a boule of silicon, just a, just a big old cylinder of it. And it's the cylinder that gets sliced up and creates the, the circular shape that you always see the chips printed on. That's, that's why it's like that. Now the last step is to add some final deposition layers to the wafer. These are coatings of light resistant and photosensitive materials. And then the chips are created by basically blasting those layers with an electron beam laser. This process is called lithography. So you can think of ASML's machines as a kind of a 3D printer, one that operates with the accuracy of 1 1,000th the width of a human hair. Just for reference, a human hair is 50 microns. And it's this ever smaller nanoscale printing that's allowed ASML to keep up with Moore's law, that being the, the doubling of transistors every year onto the same space. Which, as I've talked about here before, is getting to the point where we're starting to see some weird quantum tunneling effects. That's, that's starting to become an issue at this scale. Right now they're dealing with it by raising the resistance at the gates, or, or making the gates more complex so rogue electrons don't ruin the processing. And this is making it possible for their machines to print at 5 nanometers, with 2 nanometers coming very soon, like maybe 2025 soon. Now you may want more details on that statement, and I don't have them. All I can say is that ASML is very confident they can get down to two nanometers, and even smaller. Keep in mind the EUV tech that they use right now took 30 years to perfect, so they're kind of working right now on the microchips of 2060. Like they're starting to think in picometers instead of nanometers. A picometer is one one trillionth of a meter. 
Now, obviously there's a lot of details I'm leaving out here. This is a very high level view. And frankly, some of their technology is proprietary, so I don't have access to it. Nobody else does either, but I'm just kind of giving you the broad strokes here. Now, again, to be clear, ASML doesn't actually make the chips. They don't design the chips. That's done by the, the various chip manufacturers. But ASML makes the machine that makes it possible for them to make these chips. If it helps to think of it this way, it's kind of like ASML makes the oven and the manufacturers are the bakers, if that makes sense. So for a little background, ASML stands for Advanced Semiconductor Materials Lithography, and it was originally a spinoff from Philips. And uh, they, you know, they kind of struggled at first, but they eventually found success with their PAS2000 step and scanner. Then ASML came out with the PAS5500, which is still used today. So I think it's safe to say that Stepper really let them step up their game. <laughs> They then continued their winning streak with their twin scan tech and immersion lithography. And then shortly after that in 2010, extreme ultraviolet tech was born. That's the EUV I was talking about a minute ago. That's still state of the art to this day. And these machines that they make cost anywhere from $150 million to up to $340 million for their top of the line stuff. How might they justify charging that kind of money for a little box that makes chips from a piece of rock? We'll buckle up. So it all starts with molten droplets of tin. Very tiny, they're only 25 microns in diameter. They get shot out of a generator at 70 meters per second. So the first thing that happens is they get shot by a low intensity laser that kind of flattens them into a, an, an ellipsoidal pancake shape. And then a more powerful laser pulse vaporizes that flattened droplet to create a plasma. This plasma emits EUV light and it does this 50,000 times a second. I'm sorry, just in case your mind wasn't uh, sufficiently blown. We're talking about a 25 micron tin ball traveling 70 meters per second, getting blasted by a laser 50,000 times a second. And that's just to create the light source. Also, this machine works 24-7, 365. So if there are 86,400 seconds in a day, that's 4.3 billion times this machine is vaporizing tin into extreme ultraviolet light every day. But that's just, again, to make the light. Here's where things get even crazier, because now that EUV light has to be bounced off a series of Zeiss made mirrors. These mirrors are so perfectly made that if they were laid out the size of the United States, the tallest hill in the United States would be 0.4 microns high. These mirrors have to be this accurate to make the light print with such extreme precision, and each one of them costs $100,000. Finally, these mirrors bounce into what's called a reticle. This reticle is kind of like Kind of like a cookie cutter of the process, to go back to the whole baking metaphor. It kind of shapes the light into the pattern needed for the transistor that needs to be printed. Now what all these optics don't do is actually move the laser around on the wafer. It's just, it's just far too delicate for that. So what happens is that it has to move the wafer itself using what's called a wafer robot stepper. Just in case you're wondering if this is any less impressive, it keeps the wafer moving at a rate of 700 millimeters per second. That is faster than an accelerating fighter jet. And yeah, it just kind of basically prints this pattern over and over and over again until the wafer's full. At which point they put in a new wafer and a new reticle and the process starts all over again. ASML's machines also make things like DRAM and storage memory. And yeah, like I said a second ago, on the low end, these things are $160 million just to buy a machine to make the thing that the company wants to make. Or if you're Intel and say you don't want the machine of today, you want the machine of tomorrow, you can have it for a cool $340 million. Now, if you're a CEO of a company and that makes your butthole clench just a little too tight, you can always buy from a competitor but there are none. The CEO of ASML said that the reason they don't have any competitors is because, well, it's hard. <laughs> EUV took over 30 years to make work. The CEO also said that they have to spend $60 million a year just for security to repel spies and cyber attacks. Yeah, and the fact that China is trying to steal their tech as opposed to just starting over and doing it themselves kind of gives you an idea of how hard this is. Oh, and by the way, this company that kind of secretly runs the world, where are they run from? Who's behind this? Hang on, let me look. It's from, uh, Veldhoven in the Netherlands. Of course it's the Dutch. Yeah, apparently computer chips are just the 21st century version of Spice. If you didn't see my Spice Trade video, you should go check it out. It's, uh, it's illuminating. Although to be fair to the Dutch, the company may be headquartered there, but that extreme ultraviolet technology that I was talking about that, that makes all this dominance possible, it's not actually theirs. I mentioned earlier that ASML was spun off from Philips. Well, Philips, which is headquartered in the United States, they hold the patent to that technology. Which is why when the United States told ASML to not sell to China, they sort of had to listen. Also, caveat, ASML does have competitors for making other kinds of chips, just nothing for the, for the highest end EUV chips. 
For example, there's DUV printing or deep ultraviolet. This is less complicated. And actually Nikon and Canon are strong competitors there. And here you thought they just made cameras and printers. So yeah, the China thing, um, it's kind of a big deal. And before things get too political, understand this was actually initiated by the Trump administration, but the Biden administration has continued this policy. Now what this means for China is that they really want to compete technologically with the rest of the world. They either need to figure out how to compress 30 years of EUV development down to, well, nothing, or find another source of chips. And you know who manufactures 90% of the world's most advanced computer chips? Taiwan. Yeah. But the US is desperate to catch up in the chip race as well. Yeah, the pandemic really exposed that our American supply chain was very highly dependent on semiconductors from abroad. And not even the super advanced chips, but even the basic 10 cents of pop chips. And this is why back in October, Congress passed and President Biden signed the Chips and Science Act, which allocates $280 billion to chip manufacturing and research, as well as build a more inclusive STEM workforce, which is the science part of the act. The funding breaks down like this. $200 billion is for scientific R&D and commercialization. $52.7 billion is for semiconductor manufacturing, R&D, and workforce development. $24 billion of tax credits for chip production and $3 billion slated for programs aimed at leading edge technology and wireless supply chains. Since the act was passed, plants have been announced in the United States from Intel, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, Global Foundries, Samsung, and Texas Instruments, which is apparently still a thing. The hope is that the CHIPS Act will make the United States more of a player in the semiconductor space. Today, we make about 12% of the world's semiconductors. We made 37% in the 1990s. Also, the semiconductor industry is poised to become a $1 trillion industry by the end of the decade, so yeah, the US wants a piece of that. And at the moment, that just means more machine sales for ASML. ASML sold 55 of their machines in 2022. They're expecting to sell 60 machines in 2023. And they also hope to make improvements on their biggest, most advanced machine right now called the NEX 3600D. The big deal about the NEX 3600D is they'll be able to do 20% more wafers in a given time. Uh, that's, that's a lot of chips. And they're also working on the next generation of these machines called the high numerical aperture EUV machine. Because like I said before, they're, they're actually kind of already working on the next 30 year technology. I mean, who can even imagine what that'll be like? ASML is a company that's in a race with Moore's Law. They basically have no other competitors to race against. Which is kind of interesting to me. It kind of makes Moore's Law a self-fulfilling prophecy when you think about it. Like, like the only reason we're keeping up with Moore's Law is so that we can keep up with Moore's Law. But hey, if all that processing power makes it more possible for us to see to the edge of the universe, peer further inside the atom, and cure all kinds of diseases, I mean, I'd say it's worth it. Yeah, the kind of precision these machines are capable of is just nothing short of mind-blowing. That's how they've been able to dominate the market. Precision, much like today's sponsor, Henson Shaving. If you somehow don't know the story of Henson Shaving by now, they started as an aerospace manufacturing company. They make precision parts for satellites and space probes. They've got things that they made that are on Mars right now. And along the way, they realized that they could apply this precision to razors to not just make a better shave, but a less expensive and more sustainable one. Let me explain. The cartridge razors you're used to, they might have multiple blades, but they're not supported all the way across, leading to skipping and jumping across the skin, what they call chatter. But Henson razors support the blade all the way across to a depth of only 27 microns, a fraction the width of a human hair. Actually smaller than that ball of tin that ASML blasts into oblivion. Anyway, the support leads to less chatter and a smoother shave. And these safety razors that you use on it, they're way less expensive. They're only 10 cents each compared to $2 for these cartridge razors. And they're 100% recyclable, so no plastic taking up space in the landfills. They come in a variety of colors, and if you enter the promo code Joe Scott at checkout, you can get a 100 pack of blades completely for free. Just make sure you add that pack to your order first. The coupon will discount the price. Now, the razor itself might be a bit pricier than the handles that you're used to, but the only reason the other razor companies sell them so cheap is because they make you pay out the nose for the cartridge. Henson's different. With Henson, you pay one time up front for a nice razor, and then the cost goes down over time, as you can see here in this chart. It's a razor that will last you the rest of your life, and the free 100 pack of blades will last, I mean, at least a year. So yeah, once you buy this razor, you won't be spending another dime on shaving for a very long time. So if you haven't tried it yet, I can highly recommend them. I use them myself, and hey, they make good Christmas presents for any hairy mammal in your life. So go to hensandshaving.com slash Joe Scott, find a razor you like, and enter the code Joe Scott at checkout to get your free 100 pack of blades for free.
Links down in the description. Big thanks to Henson for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who are supporting this channel, forming an awesome community, keeping the lights on around here. Can't thank these guys enough. I got some new names I need to shout out real quick. We got Marianne Burbridge, I think, <laughs> Angela Smith, Equinon, uh, Brian Garby, Michael Homison, um, Stefan Orn, Raymond Impost Impostasto, I think, <laughs> Jimmy Powell, JC Hoke, and Vanessa F. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and just be part of an awesome community, you can go to uh, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. I know what it is. I'll get there. Also, I'm making a bit of a merch push these days. I'm trying to find another way to support the channel here. So all these shirts that you see me wearing in these videos, they are all for sale at answerswithjoe.com slash store. There's also plenty of other uh, fun merchandise that are like branded with my little logo on it. There's a patch right there. We got stickers, we got pins. Anyway, go check it out answerswithjoe.com slash store. I'm pushing merch now. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that one. Uh, or any of the little uh, thumbnails on the side that have my face on them, go check those out. And if you like them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.